Medical school is obviously a very challenging time. I started off med school in anatomy scoring below average on tests, which was kind of the first time in my life that that happened to me, and it was extremely frustrating. I toiled with different study techniques for a long time, and I finally found something that worked, and that's what I'm gonna discuss in this video. After applying these new and unique ways of memorizing information, I was able to reach all of my academic goals in med school and succeed in the ways that I wanted to succeed. This video is not just for medical students and can be literally applied to anyone trying to improve their academic performance. In this video, I'm gonna discuss ways to easily and efficiently memorize and learn information in as short a time as possible and learn information for the long term, meaning you don't just forget it after the exam, but you're able to retain the information months and even years down the line. And be sure to stick around for the end of the video where I talk about study techniques that actually have been proven by evidence to not work. And there are things that you should generally try to avoid in your studies. Information generally exists on a spectrum. There are concepts that really need to be understood. And on the other hand, there are facts that need to be memorized. In this video, I'm gonna talk about ways to easily memorize the facts and I'm gonna talk about effective ways to gain an understanding of important concepts. The techniques discussed in this video will help you effectively learn, master, and retain information for any and all exams. The first extremely important technique to implement is practice questions and active recall. When you're studying, you want your brain to actually have to do work and think rather than just passively reading or highlighting information. So practice questions and active recall are ways that you are testing your brain. The process of actively trying to have to remember a fact or a concept is creating like neuronal connections in your brain. And these connections that you're forming within your brain will allow you to retain the information and, and help you remember it in the setting of a test. You're really not challenging your brain if you're just sitting, staring at a textbook and reading page after page of word after word after word. You're not challenging your brain. You're not forcing your brain to make connections. You're not forcing your brain to really remember anything. You're simply just staring at information and reading it and hoping that it sticks. Practice questions are awesome because they can test facts that need to be memorized, but they can also test higher order things like concepts that need to be understood. For example, physiology in medical school is something that, yes, there are things within physiology that you memorize, but generally it's something that really needs to be understood and understood well. Rather than just reading a textbook on physiology where you're passively looking at words and trying to make connections with them, if you're doing a practice question or a test question of some kind and you're asked about a certain physiology concept, if you don't understand what's being asked and understand the concept being tested, you won't get it right. So what's great about practice questions is they are able to point out to you in the form of a wrong answer that you need to learn something better. And the great thing is you read the explanation of that question you got wrong and you understand it better. This is opposed to just reading a textbook where you're reading about a concept, but you're never testing your brain or testing yourself. So you don't really know if you understand it that well because you're not testing yourself. So again, practice questions are extremely effective and much better than just reading or passively highlighting or summarizing your notes. Practice questions are testing your ability to actually understand a concept. There are studies that have shown that the students that did more practice questions in preparing for step one had higher scores. The second extremely effective study technique is space repetition. Space repetition, like practice questions, also involve active recall where you're literally asking your brain to remember a fact or piece of information. So you're testing your brain and putting your brain in uncomfortable positions to remember things. Space repetition in the form of flashcards is an extremely awesome way to memorize facts. They can be used for concepts, but generally I think concepts are better tested on test questions that can ask second or third order questions that are a little bit more complicated, but flashcards are great for like one or two word facts that you just need to memorize quickly. When I think of space repetition, I refer to something called the memory curve. The memory curve depicts the brain's retention of knowledge over time. So the gist of this is, you're presented with a piece of information that you learn. If over time you don't see that information again, slowly and gradually your memory of that information fades, and it fades until you've essentially forgotten it completely. The beauty of space repetition is, you see something, you learn it, and then as you start forgetting it, you're presented with that information again, and you either relearn it or solidify it further in your brain. And seeing information at periodic repetitive episodes over time will slowly and slowly bolster your knowledge of that certain topic, and you'll remember that information longer the more times you are presented with that question over time, over a space period of time. You've probably heard about Anki, which is a space repetition app that works via flashcards. You can put anything onto Anki in the form of a flashcard, and then you test yourself on these different concepts. If you get it right, you click that you got it right and you won't see that information for a bit longer of time. But if you don't get it right or you just kind of get it right, you can select accordingly and you'll be presented with that information sooner. So if there's something that you're not getting right over and over again, you'll keep seeing it until you finally get it right. Once you get it right, you click that you got it right and you won't see it for a little bit longer, but the next time you see it, you'll probably know it a little bit better than you did earlier because you've seen it over and over and over and your brain has had numerous practice attempts to try to remember the information. 
but Anki is a great app and a great option for facts that need to be memorized. The third technique, and this is really one of my favorite things that I did as a medical student, and when I implemented this, my scores got drastically better, and that is a memory palace or method of Loki. Memory champions of the world use the memory palace to literally memorize insanely long lists of numbers like pi or facts. These memory champions can use the memory palace to memorize the order of cards in a 52 deck of cards and then recite the order with 100% accuracy. And there is real science behind the Memory Palace. You've probably heard of Sketchy Medical and Pygmonic. These both utilize the Memory Palace concept of applying images or pictures to certain facts and then putting those images into a greater picture. And then it's your task to then memorize the picture rather than the words. But by memorizing the picture and the images in the picture that represent certain concepts, you can then recall and remember crucial information for your tests. So this is how you do it. The goal of the Memory Palace is to memorize information in the form of images or pictures or symbols that you put in a familiar place in your brain, be it like your house, the school you went to, any sort of familiar place that you can easily visualize. You assign different concepts or things that you're trying to memorize, certain visual cues or symbols or images, and then you place all these images and visual cues into this familiar location and create kind of a story in your brain. And when you create this story, your brain can then in the future recall this information and recall these different images that you've assigned to certain concepts. And you can remember the concepts and recall them months and even years in the future for tests or whatever setting you're trying to remember something, you can recall this information. So here's an example. I used the Memory Palace to memorize the lung cancer chart in first aid where you had to memorize different facts about the different types of lung cancer, being adenocarcinoma, small cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. I'm gonna go through an example of how I remembered the facts for squamous cell carcinoma. And before I start, I'll say that I was able to memorize this information in like 30 minutes, and I have to this day still not forgotten the memory palace, and I can recall it with the snap of a finger. So I created a memory palace of my house to memorize the different types of lung cancer and the facts surrounding these different types of lung cancers. I assigned the living room to be my memory palace room for squamous cell carcinoma. So I created different images and symbols and put them into my living room and everything in my living room was squamous cell carcinoma. My childhood bedroom was where I remembered the things for small cell carcinoma and then the backyard deck is where I remembered everything for adenocarcinoma. So I was able to organize it by room. Here are a couple examples of things I applied to kind of memorize the facts of squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma on microscopy is known for having keratin pearls, which are basically just like circular pink things on the staining, and they really just look like pink circles. So I assigned a basketball to the keratin pearl, and I made the basketball pink. And yeah, you may laugh and think that's crazy, but I literally have never forgotten the pink basketballs to this day. So the pink basketballs represented keratin pearls. So I've assigned Keratin Pearls is the pink basketball. I picture now in my living room, my brother bouncing the pink basketball. Squamous cell carcinoma also has the tendency to cavitate. So I took the word cavitate and had to think of something. So my dad's a dentist, so he fixes cavities. And you probably get it, cavitate cavities. So I put my dad on the couch in my childhood living room and he's fixing a cavity on my sister who's had a couple cavities in her life. And again, this sounds kind of crazy, but I promise you, this is how you memorize information. So I've got my living room representing squamous cell carcinoma. I've got my brother bouncing a pink basketball in the living room. And then I've got my sister on the couch with my dad with his tools fixing a cavity. As you can probably see, that did not take very long to do. And I have two of the facts memorized that I will literally never forget. This is stuck in my head now all throughout medical school and I'm finishing up my third year of internal medicine now. That's like four years I've remembered this memory palace and I can promise you the lists of tables I tried to just summarize and reread and highlight, I have forgotten. Those were forgotten probably a week after the test. Technique number four to memorize information and learn concepts is to work with your peers to test each other and teach each other. There's something called the Feynman technique which is named after a guy with the last name Feynman. But the gist of it is if you really understand a piece of information, you should be able to simplify it down from a complex topic to a simple topic and explain it to like a six-year-old. So in med school or whatever level of schooling you're in, you're all kind of at the same academic level, so you don't necessarily have to teach it as if you're teaching it to a six-year-old. But the gist of this is if you can understand a concept enough to simplify it and then teach it to someone at various levels of training, you are clearly demonstrating mastery of that topic. And in the process of trying to simplify a complex topic and then teach it to someone, you're one, reinforcing the information in your brain to where you'll remember it longer and be able to recall it in the future. And two, you're kind of just reinforcing it and helping someone else. Another thing I did a lot of in med school was like randomly quizzing and testing my roommates and they would do the same to me. Like when we were studying for step one, we had like a hallway and then our three bedrooms. And my roommates would like literally yell across the hall, like, hey, what's the 
you know, mutation associated with osteosarcoma. And like one of us would yell back the mutation, which I've actually forgotten because I didn't put it in a memory palace. And we literally just like all day in between our studying, like yell at each other and quiz each other. And that type of stuff really sticks because it's active recall. Again, you're forcing your brain to remember information. So bottom line, teaching each other, quizzing each other, testing each other, those are all ways to solidify information in your brain, put your brain through active recall, and generally this is a lot better than just like passively reading information. Technique number five, and I'm gonna keep this relatively brief because I'll make a more extensive video on it later, but it's to just like optimize your life and optimize your study routine. That includes like getting enough sleep, taking breaks. You can't just study all day for eight hours straight. You need to take breaks, your brain needs a break. Exercising is a big thing for your mental health. If you have better mental health, you'll study better, you'll do better on your tests. You minimize distractions, stay off TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, whatever social media rage is going on. Just stay off of it while you're studying. You can access it in your breaks, just don't do it while you're studying. Minimize distractions at all costs. And kind of plan ahead and create a schedule. If you schedule every hour in the day, it kind of helps you hold yourself accountable, stay on task, and if you feel like you have a schedule, it's a lot easier to just remain organized throughout the day and get things done that you need to get done. Technique number six involves something called the Hebbian theory. To summarize the Hebbian theory into one line, it's this, neurons that fire together, wire together. And what that means is the more that you can kind of intertwine the information or make connections within the information that you're studying to other concepts and intertwine these concepts, all this integration and higher order thinking that your brain is going through is creating neuronal connections that allow you to then recall the information in the future. So if you get a question on a certain topic, try to intertwine the concepts of that topic at a kind of second or third order level, like think beyond just the question, relate that information to other information that you're studying, make connections, and you'll be amazed at how that really helps your brain remember information and recall it in the future. So here's an example, like suppose you get a question on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is a med school or residency level question. This isn't necessarily college pre-med, so I apologize to those of you that are watching that aren't med school or residency, but hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an obstructive cardiomyopathy that leads to sudden cardiac death in athletes. Suppose you get a question about an athlete that has sudden cardiac death. They ask you what the disease is, you select hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Don't necessarily stop there. You know, think about, okay, if they don't explain it in the answer, what was the probable cause? Ventricular arrhythmia. And then start thinking about ventricular arrhythmias. How do we treat ventricular arrhythmias? What drugs do we do? What drugs might we use in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? What's the underlying issue in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Start thinking of all the things you can of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Try to make these connections to different things, make connections within the information, and you'll just really develop a much higher order level of thinking rather than just answering hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, most common cause of sudden cardiac death, and moving on. If you kind of go into those second or third orders of thinking and really try to make connections, you'll retain the information much better. I'm gonna make a separate video for point number seven, but I wanna briefly talk about the things that do not work as effectively when you study. And those techniques that don't work are passively reading, summarizing your notes, and highlighting. In my opinion, reading a textbook is a very old fashioned and antiquated way to learn information. One, it's very passive, where you're literally just reading words on a page, trying to learn it, and it's very difficult to retain much of what you read, especially if you're reading lots of chapters at once. Yes, textbooks are awesome for reference, but in general, I don't think, and evidence has shown that passively reading from a textbook is not an effective way to challenge your brain and learn information. Highlighting, reading, and summarizing information has been shown to be low utility in studies. There's a paper by Dunlosky et al, which basically says that reading, highlighting, summarizing your notes are, quote, low utility, meaning that they are not effective study techniques. Yes, they can work and have worked for people. That's what I did in college and it got me by. And like I said in the beginning, it was really med school where it caught up with me until I changed my study habits. But in general, they're just not efficient ways to learn information. And in something like medical school where you're short on time, you need to find more efficient ways to learn information. Well, y'all, thank you so much for watching. I hope this video helps you going forward to kind of tinker with your study techniques a little bit, take out the things that aren't working for you, apply some or all of these concepts from this video. And I promise you, if you do this and really work on it, you should begin to see some academic improvement. This can again be applied to medical students, law students, really any sort of student at any level can apply these things to help memorize information and it should be of great benefit. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing y'all in the next video.